What's going on everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Circle Pit. It's officially our one year birthday today, so happy birthday to The Circle Pit. Um, as you guys just heard, that was an introduction from the Berserker Blothar from Guar. Um, I know I, I announced it on my Facebook page and Instagram page and I just got off the phone with him a few hours ago, so... His interview will be coming up very shortly. I just want to catch you guys up on some things really quick. Um, the Circle Pit is back, officially. Every Friday night at 6.30pm, your favorite podcast is back on air. So, with that being said, bands are reaching out to me. I'm trying to line up some more interviews, as I did with Blothar. And... One band that stuck out to me the most and reached out a couple weeks ago was this German death metal band, Profanation. And they just made a new album. It's titled Into Cascades. You guys gotta check them out. I'm gonna play you guys a new song in just a moment. But if you're just hearing about them now, go to my Facebook page and click on the link to their name and go like their page. Check out all of their music and buy some of their merch because this band is brutal, this band is heavy, and this band is amazing. So without further ado, this song is titled Bloodbath in Heaven. Enjoy. Oh, my God. 
Welcome back. That was Blood, Bath, and Heaven by German death metal band Profanation. Again, go check out their Facebook page. Go like them on Instagram and Twitter. And show them some support. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Here it is. The interview with Blothar from Guar. Welcome to the Circle Pit, Blothar. How have you been lately? Ah, oh, I've been terrible, you know. I've been uh, just in constant pain. I'm an old fucker. No, actually, I'm I'm fine. I mean, we we've been doing great, you know. The war is having having fun as we always do. Uh, right now, we're writing some music, which in our case just really involves doing drugs <laughs> with a tape recorder on. What kind of drugs so, are you guys doing? It's now been a few years since you've taken over as the lead singer of Guar. Um, your right. new album, The Blood of Gods, has been out for quite some time, and you guys done a lot of shows. How have the audience reacted to uh, to you being the singer and taking over for Odorous? Well, you know, I think that uh, people watch Guar, and uh, they come to a Guar show, and it, at, at first they really didn't know what to expect, what is this going to be like without Odorous, but I feel like uh, people... Uh, have watched it and they're not at all disappointed. I mean, they're you know it's still a war show that's on stage there. Yeah. You know, we're still the greatest rock and roll show in the history of rock and roll. Um, and uh, you know, we, we so I mean, the fans have been very receptive. Uh, of course, you know, there's people who say, "Well, it'll never be the same." Yeah, and it's like, no shit, Sherlock. You know, nothing stays the same. But it's you know, I mean, like short of. And, and, you know, it's certainly not beyond Guar to raise the dead. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, in this case, uh, the problem really isn't necessarily that Odorous is dead. It's that he's completely gone. Like, we can't find him anywhere. So, yeah. you know, so, I mean, uh, in our case, like, you know, we, we have to soldier on. We have to keep doing music and, and doing shows and doing what we do best. And uh, the people have been receptive to it. And I think pro- part of that is that... Uh, they didn't, you know, necessarily understand all the parts and pieces of war, all the little elements that were part of it, uh, that are part of it, that, uh, um, you know, all of the, what it takes to get the show on stage, all the slaves that we have, you know, those folks are still around. Like, the, they're still working hard to, to make war the greatest band in the universe. How did you feel stepping in for Odorous? Well... You know, uh, people ask me, you know, how do you step into, you know, how do you fill his shoes? And my answer is always, well, he didn't wear shoes, you know, because he didn't. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So it really is just more like stepping into the puddle of shit that he, where he used to stand, you know. Um, <laughs> it, so we, I mean, we, it's like being, you know, the, the ringmaster of a, Three ring gang bang circus, you know, it's just completely fucked up. But <laughs> you know, you're standing in front of a careening train that's ready to go off the rails at any minute. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like in Road Warrior when when the guys are strapped to the hood. You know, that's <laughs> pretty much what it feels like to be the lead singer in Guar. But uh, you know, so it's constant excitement. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, we were, we had to do something different. We couldn't just keep doing the same uh, sort of records that Guar had been doing um, because then it would just seem like Guar without Odorous. Um, and, you know, with, you know, you would feel that lack a lot more than if the band tried to do something different. So that's what we did. Like, we tried to make a record that still sounds like Guar. But that is very different than Guar, and uh, or than previous records. Maybe not previous, all previous records, but certainly the later records. Yeah. Um, but it feels, you know, the answer 
answer is that it feels great. You know, it's like, uh, um, you know, nobody here, if, if everybody would like to have Odorous back and his slave, Dave Brocky. Everybody, that would be the best situation. I have dreams about it. I dream uh, that I wake up and that uh, Odorous is back. And uh, I've had this dream more than once. And we say to each other, you know, well, what should we do? Like, um, and I'm always like, well, <laughs> give me that bass guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, y- y- you constantly have the 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 worry that uh, at any minute you're going to be attacked on stage and killed. So yeah. really, my attention is usually divided by uh, the enemies that we have, the groupies that we have, the drugs that we do. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it was certainly a big shift in my life to become the singer for Guar, but it is fun. So you just um, you just said, uh, hand me that bass guitar. Now, previously you were Beefcake the Mighty, correct? That's right. And how did you get that position? You met Dave in the 80s, right? Well, yeah, I mean, if you want to, yeah, when uh, my human slave, uh, Michael Bishop, was... Uh, a young lad. Uh, he did meet uh, Dave Brocky in, uh, Dave was in a band called Death Piggy. And, you know, basically we just had hardcore bands that were playing. And uh, I became interested in, in what Guar was doing. Uh, I was recommended to him by the bass player that they had at the time. And so that's how it got started. But there wasn't a Beefcake the Mighty or even an Odorous, like at that time. Like yeah. we just sort of stepped in and, and redid all that stuff, you know, like just did it all. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, Guar is famous for killing a whole bunch of celebrities and just people on stage. Who is next on your kill list or who would you just love to kill? Well, I mean, we've tried to kill Trump. We kill Trump every single night. He just comes back. He just haunts the stage. Yeah, he really, you know, he, he can't he can't be killed. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, there's all kinds of people that are on the chopping block. Uh, you know, maybe uh, AOC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Cortez. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Elizabeth Warren. Maybe Bernie Sanders, although we've killed a Bernie Sanders before. Um, you know, I mean, one thing is that uh, right now, the principal enemies of Guar uh, are Sawborg Destructo, and then there's various other characters, Cardinal Sin, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, just sort of even uh, Techno Destructo, just enemies that we've had in the past um, that we're going to continue to kill or to, to battle and never quite kill. Yeah. Um, it's like like an episode of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> you come very close, but you never quite get there. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, as far as celebrities, man, it's a it's a wide open world, right? Uh, Nicki Minaj. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who we actually have talked about doing recently. You know, really what we do is we just sort of look through the headlines and pick, you know, the, the, the most egregious offenders of, of taste and sensibility and and try and kill them. Yeah. We're, we're always killing the Pope. We've been killing the Pope lately a lot. For us, it's government figures, religious figures, you know, figures yeah. of authority. So is the Pope going to be on your next tour at all? Can you tell us that? Uh, well, we haven't really put that together yet. We don't know what's going to be happening on the next tour. Yeah. Um, still, still messing around with it, trying to see what happens. Um, but, uh, we have been talking about, I think that, uh, the next tour is probably going to have something to do with the planet Flobquare 7, uh, a place that Guar in our mythos, uh, the battle of Flobquare, Flobquare 7 is kind of a, an important juncture in the mythos of Guar. The moment where Guar is cast down, um, 
know, like like Milton, Satan. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're saying. <laughs> um, now, as we're, as we're on this phone call, are you in Antarctica or are you back on Scum Doggy now? Well, right now I'm in Antarctica, just you know, in our frozen octagon studio. We've had some visitors lately, unwelcome trespassers. <laughs> There's Navy SEALs who keep coming oh. in to the, to the pentag- pentagram down here that we have and, and trying to see what the hell we're doing. <laughs> But uh, you know, I mean, like that—that's—that's where we—that's where we live. That's where we, you know, where we make our music. Yeah. It's on a frozen cave. You guys just wrapped up your gorecore metal and more tour a few weeks ago, and how did that go? And how many people would you say were killed? That was a lot of a lot of death and destruction. Um, you know, I mean, what Hatebreed didn't kill, we finished off. Yeah. It was pretty brutal, and. Uh, you know, it was it was a great success, um, and then we did a little weekend holiday run after that. That also was nice. Um, we the band is doing great. You know, the, that's awesome. Yeah, so we're very happy about it. Any news on a new album or tour yet? Well, we are working on the new album. As, as you know, that that's what I was doing when you called. Yeah. Sitting there playing some music. Is it going to be different from Blood of Gods, or are you guys going to change up the sound a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be, it's seeming like it's going to be a lot different than Blood of Gods. Okay. Um, like, just judging by the material we've got so far. Um, you know, and I think we're, it's going to have a different feel, of, a different feel to uh, Blood of Gods. It's going to be a very heavy record, that's what we're focusing on. Okay, nice. Super heavy. You know, Blood of Gods is a heavy record, but it's got a lot of, uh, you know, the songs are a little more put together. There's some, uh, you know, we focused on hooks a lot on that record. Yeah. And that was partly because that was something that Guar had done in recent years. So, you know, we were trying to do something different that would set the record apart and not instantly be held up to Guar's catalog and people say, look, this is a cheap imitation. I mean, I'll give an example of that is Sawborg song, right? Okay. Like, if, you know, Sawborg Destructo, if that song was an Aerosmith-style rock song with somebody singing, you know, like, which is what the first techno song is, um, then it would just come off as a cheap imitation. So we had to do something different. So we went with the sort of, you know, epic metal sound for it. And, um, uh, you know, stuff like that is still still on our minds, um, but now we're looking at the last record and, and thinking of you know trying to pick the elements out of Blood of Gods that we really liked and, and do more of that. But that was the plan. But as it has turned out, it just seems like everything's a lot different. So I think that's what Bar always has done, man. Is they put out records that people don't expect. Um, the band's sound changes a lot as as we have, as we go. Oh yeah, a couple months ago, you guys did ASM Guar. How did that come about? <laughs> that was, you know, just a camera <laughs> showing up at our uh, uh, at the offices of the uh, what do you call that? Uh, the Onion. Um, was it the Onion? No, it wasn't the Onion. I can't remember where it was. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the onion, I know that. Um, uh, now you got me thinking. Was it a revolver? I can't remember. Anyway, basically, uh, they, they just decided to record us uh, sitting around and touching ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's what Guard does when they're silently reflecting. Is there any um, any talk about making a second one? A second ASM recording? Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked about it, but um, yeah, I don't know what we would do different. I mean, it's a weird phenomenon. Like, oh, yeah, big time. I just don't understand like, what the science behind it is or yeah. thing like that. No, it's all confusing. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's one thing we've noticed. I mean, that was the theme 
came on the blood of God, the human, the human condition just sort of gets crazier and crazier, further and further off base. Now, with the state of the world as it is now, is there anything you guys could do to stand out there? Because there's been a lot going on lately that whatever oh, right. whatever right. Gwar does, it's not not what it used to be. Well, I mean, certainly, like it doesn't have the impact that it used to have. You're absolutely right, and I think that uh, for the most part, like you know, what what the problem is is that you you know Gwar, we did our job too well. You know, we set humanity on this path of, of destruction that they were all too eager to uh, to take up. And really, at some point, Guar realized um, that you know the humanity had uh, humanity's capacity for inhumanity is uh, um, amazing. So, like you know, Guar maybe being made up of these sort of like you know the, the leftover elements of humanity, you know, the yeah. inhuman humans. Um, uh, when you, you know, when the whole world is that way, uh, then what are you going to do? How are you going to shock people when they can turn on the television and, or, or look at on the internet and see recordings of people actually being beheaded? Um, yeah. you know, women being enslaved, uh, you know, just, I mean, all kinds of, I mean, everything is recorded now. Like you can, and I think at no point in human history have we been so aware of humanity's utter depravity and and just uh, capacity for cruelty, and you know certainly um, for us, keeping up with that is something that we just stopped trying to do. Yeah. You know, like now Guar does what we do, and we're pursuing our narratives, and um, you know we're not necessarily trying to gross people out. It's weird, though, because, like, at the same time that the reality has changed, um, at least in America and really all over the world, there's also been a change where, um, you know, victims have more of, vo of a voice. Yeah. Uh, so people are able to fight back a little bit. And, at the, and also at the same time, you have a situation where uh, the, you know, humans are... Um, you know, just, I'm trying to think of how to say this, actually. Uh, I mean, what I'm trying to get at is uh, the sort of, like, you know, there is a, a vein of political correctness. Yeah. And the reason I was struggling for the words is because I hate the term politically correct, because I don't see anything. I think that that's an easy way to dismiss reasonable objections to uh, this inhuman world. Um in this cruel world yeah. but at the same time uh it does seem like there has been a kind of death of humor and it's weird because i remember after 9 11 people talked about that a lot about the death of humor like you know can we can we really are we really free to laugh again like you know does irony mean the same thing in this world um and the reaction to that like, I mean, not so. I mean, I don't think that was the case in 9-11. We saw that people could still laugh. But now, things have just gotten to the point where, uh, you know, people people aren't laughing anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's very easy, uh, you know, for a band that has the kind of <laughs> reputation and does the kind of things that Noir has uh, to step afoul of, uh, of those things. Um but we're not afraid of that. I mean, we're going to keep doing what we do because we know that what we do is meant to point out the foibles of, uh, of humanity and of modernity. You know, I mean, lately what I've been thinking about a lot is like one of the ways that, that, that these things have changed is just the death of truth, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and, yeah. and it's surprising to me considering Considering how uh, virulent conservative objections to notions of uh, this is going to sound this is very, this is very heavy. I hope your I hope your listeners are smart. Considering how people have uh, uh, you know like there, there's a kind of narrative out there that says that uh, liberalism uh, has has that they embrace this loss of truth.
truth um, and the, the loss of, of, of definite meaning. But I don't see that coming from liberals. What I see is uh, this massive sort of conservative impetus where like, they seem to have taken that lesson and said, oh, okay, well, what that means is anything you say, you can say it doesn't have to be true. Yeah. You know, all, it, all, all it needs to do, and uh, you know, Chomsky pointed that out, Noam Chomsky, that like, you know, it doesn't have to be true, you just have to say it. And yeah, exactly. once it's said, then it has its own existence. You know, it becomes something other than a fact, and it just more and more it seems like we live in a world where I mean it's really hard to get a sense of what the fuck is happening. Yeah. You know, uh, and how are people changing in that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, like you know, look at uh, what's his name, six nine. Oh yeah, Takashi uh, six nine. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> so what an amazing story that is. You know, it's like. Somebody whose entire existence, people who are so stupid, and their their notion of reality is so shaped by information and access to uh, you know like just like social media that they're posting videos of themselves committing federal crime. Like I, I just don't understand that. Yeah. Like how how somebody can. Can, I mean, like, I, I just, I just, I, I, I dread for that young guy the moment in prison when he realizes, uh, oh, wow, this is with me forever. You know, this is what I've done. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's weird. Like, you see that even in the sort of, like, you know, the face tattoos. It looks like, you know, the thing that people used to think made you distinctive, right? Your face and how you look. Um, even that is being covered up with a kind of sameness. Yeah. You know, like that, uh, and that sameness is comes comes from, from, from criminal elements, right? I mean, the face tattoo, the only place you used to see face tattoos was in documentaries about prisons. Right? Yeah. And now, you know, you see it on pop singers. Not... <laughs> Not hip hop stars, but pop singers. You know, it's almost like people have grown so accustomed to living in a world without consequences that they can't conceive of the even the existence of consequences. Um, it's amazing. So yeah, war finding our way in that—that's the art. That's the art part. Right? Yeah. Um, and and that's what we keep doing. You guys are doing it good though. So keep up the good job. I um, wow, that was a lot. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so before we begin to wrap this up, um, I have a couple questions for you from our Instagram followers. So the yeah. first question is how much blood would you say is used for one show? Well, we, it depends on how many people are there, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, how many people make the mistake of getting too close to the stage, but <laughs> But in reality, you know, it's about, uh, you know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to go look at our reserve of humans Ooh. that is sitting here waiting to be killed. <laughs> Hold on just a Let me ask the man himself. Sawboard. There we are. How many gallons of blood do we use at a show? Billions and billions. No, actually, it's more like a uh, hundred. A hundred. A hundred. Gallons of blood. Jesus. And that's a real answer. That's per show. Per show. Oh my God. You got to amp that up. Get some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the amazing thing. Like, what I've noticed is, like, the very definition of bloodlust is that one of the criticisms every single tour, people say that there's less blood. Really? And every tour, we increase the blood. You know, like when war started, uh, there just wasn't that much spew at all. Like there wasn't a lot of liquid going off the stage. Um, but now, yeah, 100 gallons. And, you know, we, we just keep adding a tank. You know, like, you know, just add another tank of blood and, or another tank of spew, you know. And 
every time somehow people feel like uh, there's less than what they expect. Yeah. Well, I got to tell you, my first Guar show, I was lucky enough to make it to the barricade. <laughs> and my body was just painted in blood red for the next two days. <laughs> so it was a fun experience. Um, ma yeah. Majority of it was Trump's blood, actually. So. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Is there anything I have to worry about with that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, you're not a... As long as you didn't have a job interview the next day. That's true. <laughs> All right, next question from our Instagram followers. Do you shed your antlers in the fall, and do they grow back fuzzy? They do grow back fuzzy, um, but I don't shed them. I mean, I just kind of have to, yeah, I mean, I do the thing. You know, I, it's funny. Like, I find myself out in the woods scraping up against trees. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> dangerous too because that's the very season when there's lots of hunters out there trying to mount me on the hood of their pickup truck <laughs> and the final question do you have any life lessons for a senior in college who is about to graduate ah uh, jeez I don't know <laughs> what I can say about that a life lesson well They have really thrown their life away. <laughs> That's their first mistake. You know, the step one would be get the fuck out of that place and learn how to think for yourself. And, uh, you know, go out in the world and, and pay attention, look at things, and laugh. Laugh. And whatever that it, is, it is that you're trying to do, don't ever stop trying to do it. Just keep trying. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And no I will definitely catch you guys on the next tour. All right. Thank you. Blothar, thank you. Yeah. And have a great day. Will do. And there you have it. Thank you again, Blothar, for doing that. I hope you're listening. It really just meant the world to me that you did that. So thank you. And yeah, so. If you guys have any um, bands in mind that you want played on my show, I know I've gotten the approval to play some King Diamond and Campbell Corp. So if there's any like any of those bands that you guys want played on the show, just let me know. If you have any local bands that you want on the show, send them my way and I will find a way to get them on here. So yeah, thank you all for the support and the Circle Pit is back. I'll see you all next week. Stay metal.